It's great to be here. Thanks a lot for taking the time to come and learn a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I'm Amari Ruff, uh, co-founder and CEO of Sudu. Um, we are in more of the transportation space. Um, we leverage different technologies to connect small and medium-sized trucking companies to corporations that ship goods. So we're housed right up the road uh, at ATDC at the accelerator there. We've been there since about uh, 2016. Um, it's been a great experience. We love um, being there and having the connectivity to Georgia Tech and to this department especially to you know, come and bounce different ideas and also from a recruiting perspective is always great, you know, have all these big brains and bright minds here that we can bring onto the team and help us, uh, you know, continue to expand and reach our goals. So um, when I first started the company, um, we looked at the industry and a little bit of background on me. I'm a serial entrepreneur. This is actually um, my third company. Uh, that I've started. Um, my most previous, um, I was in the telecommunications industry where we, um, it was a contracting company and we did uh, residential and commercial installation services for major cable providers. So think of those guys that come to your house and install your cable and your, your internet and your phone service, which was um, voice over IP. I had a team of those guys and I started that company um, with one truck, a few hundred bucks, and I was able to grow it to over 200 trucks. We have five offices across the country and we we're able to exit that business. So I looked at my next thing and it was like, okay, I'll jump into logistics. And the initial goal first was just to start a trucking company. Like I thought to myself, okay, I had all these trucks. They were four rangers, not like tractor trailers. But I was like, hey, I can do the same thing, you know, easily with, with no problem. But I, I dove in and started to do a lot of discovery and I learned that it was uh, going to be a lot more capital intensive than I had anticipated. So I ended up doing um, a little more of a pivot to a non-asset based model where this is kind of what I seen in the industry, which was, you know, the trucking industry, $600 billion industry. And as we all know, everything we see, we touch, we eat was most likely moved on a truck. But what was really interesting was that 90% of all trucking companies have six or less trucks. So in order for them to get quality freight opportunities from you know, quality shippers or very large shippers, they would have to have capacity, right? At least 100 trucks to even just start those conversations. So they would have to go through freight brokers to get that quality work. And when we looked at the freight brokers, the freight brokers were really that problem. You know, They were the ones that one out of every four transactions have to go through that freight broker. And they were just glorified call centers. You know, their, their sole goal was to maximize margins off of every transaction. That was it. Not a lot of value add back to the trucker. Very limited value add back to the shippers. So here, brokers, extremely expensive. Literally sucks the life out of the trucker, barely leaving them with any money to truly run their businesses with. So when we looked at that as the problem, we thought to ourselves, okay, those brokerages are just human capital. Hundreds, thousands of people on the phones making calls to complete a transaction. What we could do is we could layer on some technology to complete that transaction. So of course, we, we live in a world where it's the, the Uber model, right? You know, everything uh, could be leveraged through you know, a machine learning component or maybe leveraging some AI. So I don't have the, the strong technical background. I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I had to, I had to reach out to some people that were a little, a little smarter than me, you know, to really bring this, this, this thought and vision to life. So my co-founder is actually, um, he, he's actually a Georgia Tech grad, um, strong product background. He's our COO today. So when I first had that full vision, it was all in my mind. I reached out to him and he was actually running one of the verticals over at ATDC. And we knew each other from um, our kids going to school together. So when I called him, he was like, hey, this sounds pretty interesting. Why don't you come up here to ATDC? Then I jumped into um, customer discovery and started to really, you know, flush out the idea and kind of home in on, you know, some sort of MVP. So we did something that was really unique that um, it's funny now looking back on it. I don't even know how we actually survived and did it. But so during customer discovery as a young company, we're probably about two, three employees strong. And um, I got an opportunity to pitch to Walmart. So um, went down to Bentonville, we pitched and 
the pitch was actually pretty good and we got a contract. But remember, we only have like three employees. How are we, how are we gonna manage that, right? So um, we ended up taking five off-the-shelf technologies and we kind of integrated them all together and we called it like our Frankenstein, right? And um, we knew that it can manage, you know, a small portion of the Walmart business, but eventually we would have to raise some venture capital to replace Frankenstein piece by piece. And we were actually able to do that. So I'll kind of roll through, and this is the freight brokers. This is kind of what they look like. And what's crazy is they look like this today. You know, literally you would walk into an office and you would see these hundreds and thousands of people all on the phones and it's just like, you know, call center or you're at like some sort of money trading brokerage or, you know, um, what do they call them, the, the boiler room. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what's going on in there. And these guys, uh, some, of, some of these companies are still sending faxes and communicating with the truckers that way. So we knew that this model could definitely be disrupted, especially in this large of an industry, if we could just get it right, right? So the way we solve this market mismatch is number one, we've created, um, well, we've gathered a network of truckers of roughly about 300,000 trucking companies that we know a lot about, right? And we were able to gather all these truckers from different methods. Of course, as a startup, you've got to be extremely scrappy. Nothing's going to come super easy to you. So you've got to you know, be able to do what it takes uh, to get things done and continue to progress the company. So we, when we recruited new members to the team, they came with existing trucker relationships. So we got some of our capacity from there. I had a relationship with a trucking association. I was able to capture all of their members and get them within our network. And then we were actually um, able to gather a list of every trucking company in the United States. And we've got a team in um, Columbia, South America that goes through and they vet that list. So the analogy I like to use is, um, I don't know if you all remember when Google Maps first launched, you would see the little cars with the globes on top that's just driving around, just collecting data. That's what our team in Columbia, South America is doing. They're calling through that list and they're asking, hey, What's your truck type? What's your trailer type? What are different lanes you like to run? What are the commodities you like to move? What's your driver's vacation schedule? How do you like to be communicated with? So all this information is being gathered and housed into our system. So here, we'll just kind of scroll through that piece. So here's um, a snapshot of what our actual system looks like. So this is where all of our carriers are housed. And if you look a little too, let's see. Little to the right, you'll see where they're approved and then there'll be a tab sometimes that says not approved. So that just lets us know kind of what their status is. And we also um, keep record of their star rating. So we keep a rating on these carriers so we know what opportunities to introduce these carriers to. Because we work with some small and medium sized businesses that um, their freight may not be time sensitive. So that allows us the opportunity to put some of those truckers on that non time sensitive freight so we can vet them and really understand what's their level of service. Once we're able to get quality ratings on these carriers, then we're able to introduce them to better paying opportunities and more high profile customers. Um, we work with some of the largest brands in the world today. So we've quality is, is key, you know, yeah, we can come in and cut the prices and, but at the end of the day, service is what's going to maintain, is what's gonna help us maintain that customer relationship. So if you look here, this is another snapshot of our system where we house all of those different preferences. So the truck type, the trailer type, you know, lanes they like to run. And then we also created a carrier portal where the carrier dispatcher or the trucker himself can log in and update this information. So if they grow their fleet or they start to expand offices or they're just looking um, just to grow their businesses and by, by capturing, you know, different commodities and moving different types of freight, they can log in and update this information themselves. And so here's something um, really cool that we've done. Um, if In the transportation industry, pricing is, is everything and pricing can be affected by various things. Um, you know, um, there could be a new law that's passed or, you know, some different stipulations and prices will go up or prices will go down. 
Um, we can get hit with hurricanes like we did last year that, you know, that are really bad back to back. And those will shoot the rates, you know, through the roof. So what we've done is we've created this proprietary, you know, pricing system where we leverage um, multiple external market data sources. And we bring that into our system and we weigh that against our internal uh, market data. So internally, this could be from different RFPs that we may have bid on that we put prices in and then the customer gives us feedback saying, hey, you're one, you're in first place or you're in 10th or you're in 30th. So we're collecting all this data and we're putting this in our system. So we feel like we've got a good understanding of where the market is. And then we bring that external data in and weigh that against our internal data to give us the most optimized price. So that's something cool that we're doing that's a little different that gives us an advantage and helps us uh, price different customers if it could be more of a, a spot basis, emergency, real-time basis, or it could even be we could leverage this tool to price more RFPs, uh, which will be locked in prices for the next year or two or quarterly rates. So this, this allows us to do that. And uh, the gentleman that actually created that system's right here. So he's our, he's our team member, a Georgia Tech guy as well. So I had to give, make sure I give Andrew a shout out. <laughs> so here is um, what we call our pseudo sage search. So what we so we connect with our customers. It could be um, which we're still in a, um, an industry that's um, a tad bit traditional and not a lot of technology advancement there. So some customers we still connect via EDI, or um, some customers we connect via API, which is more preferable for us. But we pride ourselves in being flexible and being able to connect with the customers in a way that's comfortable for them. So that helps us when it, um, from a sales cycle perspective where we're not asking our customers to change a lot of their behavior and majority of our efficiencies kind of happen on the back end. And that gives them a, a level of comfort where we're not saying like, hey, we've got to change all these different things in what you're doing. No, we'll connect with you in a way that's comfortable for you. So we feel that that's sort of like an advantage um, to, to working with Sudo. But so we'll receive that, that freight information, that data, um, It'll be lane data, meaning uh, location pickup is in Atlanta, delivery could be in Memphis, pickup times, commodities, weights, all that information will hit our system. And our algorithm is gonna take all of those different preferences into account based off of all the truckers within our network. So um, locations, um, truck type, trailer types, commodities they like to move, vacation skills, just all those things are taken into account. And that's immediately gonna give us a top five, top 10, top 50 trucks that best fit to move that load at that particular time. So right there, that's, that solves a huge issue with that human capital. If you think back to how those traditional brokers operate where they're just hitting the phones, now our operations team, which we still have customer success people because our industry still requires a human touch component to it, but we equip them with technology advances, advancements so they can react quickly and source capacity extremely quickly. And then here is where we really differentiate from our competitors is our multicast system. So the way we differentiate from traditional brokerages is number one, we're just leveraging technology. Boom, we're different. Simple as that. They're just call centers, people on phones making calls. Now on the digital side, they put us in a bucket uh, where they call us a digital broker because we're still licensed and bonded as a freight brokerage company. So we're considered a digital broker. And our competitors, um, we go against Uber Freight was just jumped in the market that's doing really well. And um, there's another company called Transfix that's out of New York. Um, they've raised um, probably about $80 million or so. So they're doing, they're doing decent, they're doing pretty well. Then there's another company called uh, Convoy, which is out of Seattle, which is backed by Bezos, right? So that, that's a lot of fun for us, right? We're going against Uber and pretty much Amazon. So, and we're just a startup out there. But remember the industry is, gigantic, $700 billion industry. So not one player is going to dominate the entire industry. Today now, a, a little fun fact is the top 18, um, well, the top 20 freight brokerages today make up less than 18% of the market, if you think about that. So it's extremely fragmented, tons of opportunity out there. These are the same talks that I have with our investors. Like, they're like, what are, you gonna, what are you gonna do against Uber and, and Bezos is another company? Why are we gonna give you money? Like, it's okay. 
Like, we're going to keep our heads down, focus on a segment of the market, and we'll win. We'll win in our particular lane. Our goal is not to, you know, defeat or conquer Convoy, but it's to stay in our lane and capture a portion of the market, which we feel extremely confident that we can do. So the way we differentiate from our competitors, the Uber Freights, the Transfixes, and the Convoys, and the, and the Convoy, I don't know if you all are aware, they just got valued at $1.1 billion in three years. So three years they've become a unicorn, so, which is really exciting. But what's cool is that when they were at our stage as a company, we're actually further along than they were. We've got bigger customers, we've got better um, margins and better net revenue. So they just had Bezos on their side, but hey, we're gonna keep working hard though. <laughs> so the, the way we differentiate is um, we feel that there's opportunity in leveraging voice technology and leveraging chatbots. That's where we really feel that we can do some things different. So our competitors are saying, hey, download this mobile app and that's gonna be the way you communicate with us. Just the Uber model, you know? You don't have to call anybody, just work with this mobile app and that's how everything's gonna operate. But our industry is extremely traditional. You know, the average age of a trucker is in the mid 50s and forcing them to adopt to new technologies is really tough. So we've seen and we know for a fact that our competitors have faced a lot of resistance in getting their adoption from a mobile app perspective. So that's where we were like, hey, we see some opportunity in voice technology. So today now, um, we do have a mobile app for those truckers that are a little more technology advanced. Um, but believe it or not, some of these guys still have flip phones. So what we've done is we've developed chatbots that can send SMS text messages with that load information. So based off of their preferences, when the load matches, um, they'll receive a text message and they can communicate back and forth and ask questions. Uh, we've also created that carrier portal that I spoke about. So if it's more a two plus truck operation that um, that dispatcher can log into the system and they could see different freight information and they could also uh, bid on different freight and ask questions and it's powered by a chatbot. But what we've also done is we've developed and designed that chatbot to actually make outgoing calls as well. So who in here is kind of familiar with uh, Google Duplex? Anybody know Google Duplex? So more of a conversational AI component. So that's where we're trying to take it. We're not there today. Today, you know, it's um, still a little robotic voice and, you know, yes or no kind of things to be said. But um, within the next six to nine months, our goal is to have that, that chat bot with the conversational AI component to it be able to complete an entire transaction, right? So you think at the press of one button, today now we can call five truckers or we can call 500 truckers, but it's extremely simplistic, you know, but we're working through it. But like I said, long-term goal is we'll press that button, we'll, we'll receive the freight information, the chat bot will analyze it, then from there we'll source the most qualified capacity, do an outreach, negotiate, secure a price, dispatch that truck, track the truck all the way to delivery, retrieve the paperwork, invoice the customer, and pay the trucker as well. That's where we're going with it. And then that would eliminate, you know, majority of the human touch component. We'll still have customer success people because that's just what's required in our industry. Things are gonna happen. But that's our goal and we feel that it's a hard nut to crack, but I'm sure with all you guys' help, we can crack that nut. Anybody confident? Help us out? Maybe? No? Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, that, so that's where we're going with it. So it's an exciting time to um, you know, be in the logistics industry from a transportation perspective. Um, in our industry also, we hear a lot about uh, driver shortage and you know there's not many truckers out there a lot of guys are retiring one of the things that we're doing to combat that is since we're enterprise focused we're starting to leverage our customers private fleets so one of our customers is um, ABM Bev um, to say and they have their own private fleet that goes from let's say warehouse to warehouse making deliveries from A to B but they're going from B to A empty so what we're going to do is turn that from a cost center now to a profit center so we may drop a UPS load on that truck or we may drop a Walmart load on that truck and we'll set different business rules 
in our system. So, of course, AB and Bev's not picking up Heineken or one of their competitors or anything like that. But um, we feel that that will give us additional capacity, quality drivers as well. So that's something that we're kind of um, experimenting as well. And something else is that's pretty cool um, is we're actually rolling out um, a new SaaS product that we are starting, we're gonna be starting a pilot with um, a chemicals company, which is a Brascom, which is um, a Brazilian owned chemicals company, but their US um, location is up in Philadelphia. So what we've done is when we spoke to them, our goal was first to help them move their chemical products, but they said, hey, we've got all these regulations and different things going on. So we have the truckers and capacity that we need, but our problem is outreach, uh, sourcing that capacity efficiently that's already within our network. So we thought it was like, uh, and back to Andrew again, who's our all-star from Georgia Tech, of course. This is his product here, this uh, pseudo SaaS platform where now we've turned, we've taken our, our technology and we've white labeled that, and we're gonna put that in the hands of our customers so they can source their capacity by leveraging our chatbots. So now it's kind of like, hey, moving freight from A to B is really thin margins. I mean, five, seven percent is what we'll see, maybe 10, you know, in a, in a, um, in a, in a great day. But we'll use that as a foundation of the business and maybe even undercut the prices just to get more customers in so we can sell them our SaaS product, which will make a lot better margins on. So those are some of the things that we're talking about. And what's cool is that being a startup, we can make these decisions real time. You know, we don't have to, you know, go through legal and a bunch of red tape. Andrew came up and was like, hey, I got this idea. He whiteboarded it and we rolled it out just like that. So that's one of the really fun things of, um, is you know working with the startup. We can just do different things, we can pivot, we can try different things out, but I like to tell the team that let's just fail fast, if anything, but let's always keep the entrepreneur spirit, let's always try different things, let's be risk takers, but you know, if it doesn't work, we'll just scrap it and we'll continue to move forward, you know, because that's how we really make an impact in, on the industry. So, I'll scroll through as I'm glancing at time. I can sit up here and talk to you guys all day, so I'm just scroll through a little bit. So today now, um, the things that I've talked about isn't you know what we think or what we hope to do. You know, it's it's what we're doing today, and it's resonating with big brands. You know, as you see, uh, Walmart was um, our first enterprise customer that we've landed. Um, we're working with other extremely large brands today, and we've got a pipeline of other strong ones as well. So definitely exciting times. And our goal is just to continue to enhance our platform and continue to grow the business and add great team members to the team. And then of course, this industry is being disrupted today, just like you know Airbnb did the hotel industry and just like Uber did the taxi cab industry. You know, Sudo is playing a part in disrupting you know, the logistics industry today. And I kind of scroll through that. And this is um, a few of our other team members today and a few of our investors that's doing it. So today now we've raised um, about $3 million um, today in uh, venture capital. So we've got a little funding. Um, we're gearing up for a Series A raise now. Um, and we're also gearing up for UPS peak season, which is one of our new customers. Um, so we'll be helping them out with the holiday delivery. So um, great times to be you know, within the Sudo umbrella. But that is a little bit about us. Um, and I guess, are we gonna open for questions now or later? I'm before, open for- Before Paul gets up, yeah, we have a little time if you could ask him okay. questions. Yeah, us. there we go. I'm open for questions. Oh, okay. I have uh, two prompt questions. One, as an early stage startup, how do you raise a team without funding? Mm. Uh, because you can't do everything you want to do. Two, uh, a business like this survives on a network uh, effect. So how do you build a network from ground up? Like, you need truckers, you need shippers mm -hmm. to make this platform happen. How do you start building that from nothing? No, great question. So number one um, was how do we actually build our team, you know, without funding? Um, wow. So I've always been really good. Uh, my strengths are um, business development and sales. Um, and by being the founder, I was able to articulate the vision of the business. So I knew that um, I could look within my network. I'm a really relationship-driven individual. So my co-founder, um, our kids actually went to school together when they were one. They're seven now. 
And I remember, you know, being at different birthday parties, I would always see him and he was always talking about technology and what he's doing at Georgia Tech. So when I had the idea of the company, um, I reached out to him. So I looked in my network and I just took a chance. And once I was able to convince him to take the crazy jump to come on board, I really engulfed myself in the technology ecosystem here in the Atlanta area, which is a really you know tight knit community. And by going to different events and um, networking with different people, you see and meet really cool people who may have worked with a startup who just exited and looking for their next thing, or they may have clunked out and ran out of funding and they're looking for their next thing. So there's always people out there that are looking that you could find and network with. Um, my, my CTO, I actually got him from being over at ATDC. He was our, um, our EIR entrepreneur in residence. We would have to check in with him on a weekly basis. And um, I convinced him to turn down a job from Amazon to jump on board with us because it's the vision, you know, just knowing that you can come on early. There's an equity component to it, which is equity is the key, because of course everybody wants to be able to have, you know, a vested interest in the business. So that's kind of how I sold that. And then from a marketplace perspective, how to, you know, build a marketplace from scratch. Um, we first were able, we worked on the trucker side first, and we're able to get a ton of capacity. Um, the truckers within our network aren't sole sudo truckers. They work with other brokerages or they may have customers on their own. But what it was is we wanted to outreach to them, reach out to them, let them know who we are, what we're doing, so we know where their, where their um, I guess their gaps are. You know, one guy may say, hey, I've got loads going from Atlanta to Memphis all the time, but I can never get out of Memphis. So we knew that information is in our system and we kept note of that. So now we get a new customer we say, hey, we're going to focus on things coming out of Memphis because J&J &J Trucking was interested in that. So we did that on a repeated basis and we're able to gain that. And then on the supply side, we're always selling. We're always, you know, looking for customers like we'll, we'll land a large customer like Walmart who may move 100,000 loads a day, maybe. Right. But we'll take the beach entry. We'll move a little bit of freight right now. And then we've got a little truckers and then we'll slowly start to grow both sides of that marketplace. So hopefully that helps with your answer. Any more questions? Oh, we got one down here? Yes, sir. I'd like to understand a little more about your revenue model. Your customers are primarily shippers, and then how do you, are you, are you mentioned you're a licensed broker, so you're mm -hmm. taking traditional brokerage commission type? Yeah. So, yeah, so the question was, um, you know, what's our revenue model? Um, yes, yeah, so we do operate like a brokerage, but we don't take the traditional brokerage margins. Traditional brokerages could be anywhere from 20 to 30, sometimes 40 percent that they're taking off the top. So Walmart or one of our customers will pay us a thousand bucks to move, you know, these loads. And then we'll pay the trucker 900 or 950 just based off of the lane. And we'll take a spread from that transaction. There's also um, a component where since we focus on small and medium sized trucking companies, there's a we call it a partner financing component because these guys need their money real time. So um, our, we pay in about net 25, net 30. They like to get paid immediately, and we um, can command around a two to three percent, you know, spread off of that. So that helps us as well. But um, as we roll out this SaaS product, and just depending on how um, the success of the pilot goes with the new customer, we'll probably start taking freight at cost or even at a loss, and incorporate that into our CAC which is our customer acquisition cost, and then just to sell them the SaaS product because we'll be 80, 90%, 95% margins off of that. So as, as we think through things, I'm thinking that'd be more of our long-term play. And of course, I gotta bounce that off of our all-star over here to make sure that that fits right. Yeah, any other questions? I mean, just out of curiosity, I, I don't know if I missed it. You're from Georgia Tech, but yes. how did you get into Sudo? Yeah, um, so I actually have a, a long history in brokerage, so I was at two other brokerages starting up their Atlanta operations before Sudo, and one of the guys that I actually hired and trained at my first brokerage that I was working with, um, Echo Global Logistics, was helping out and consulting with Sudo, and so he introduced me to Amari and Michelangelo as more of a, hey, let's just sit down and talk through ideas because some of the, my ideas I've been having uh, lined up well with what they were doing and um, you know, sold me on a vision and you know, 
week or two later, I was uh, sitting in a seat. So yeah. it was a lot of uh, luck and happenstance. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, we had some prior connections that I had trained my prior positions that worked with them or were around them at least. And what was your specialty at Tech? Um, biology. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it, it worked out. We had a, a combination of um, individuals on the team that didn't have industry knowledge, which brought value because we could look and say, why don't they do it this way? But at the same time, we needed to make sure that we brought on individuals that had that logistics experience and that background that could help balance the two. And that's where Andrew came on board um, into play. And then we also have a few more individuals. I think everybody outside of the executive suite, everybody has logistics experience, just so we've got a really good balance. And how many total people? We're, we're a team of 15 now. We've got 11 in Columbia, South America. And we actually, um, we just got a green light. We're moving our office uh, next door in ATDC. So they tore down the wall. So now it's like a double office because we're growing so loud. We're, we're like big stuff now, man. You guys got <laughs> No, no. We're, we're excited about it. And we're growing the team. We'll probably add three more team members before the year is out as we gear up for peak. My question for you is uh, how much of the, the, what you see as your big demand will be like on uh, contracts that they'll sign like a recurrent from many trips, okay, or, or that be a long type of, uh, slow clock type of thing versus uh, fast on the spot, okay, uh, uh, demand that uh, I'm going there, okay, is, is there something available soon? So where do you, where are you seeing yourself developing? Well, I think we, we see ourselves more of um, a emergency spot market plan in that area. Um, we can command higher margins there. And then our customers see a lot of value because we can react quickly, you know, by leveraging our technology. So I think that's where we'll play. Um, but a lot of times our customers will make us play in the dedicated space just to build the relationship. But from a marketplace perspective, that's not bad because it's gonna give us our critical mass and it's more predictability there. And there's a lot of truckers out there that are looking for that predictability. So it's just a matter of, um, we've, we looked at the country as we wanna build pockets, right? And then we, we want to gain critical mass in those particular pockets. And then we could do more of a load pairing, you know, component to it where, you know, truckers now are going A to B, UPS, B to C, Walmart, C to D, A, B, and Bev, then D back to A with a CHEP load. And that's the goal to be able to get to that point where truckers are in our network, we understand their growth, what they want to accomplish, what are their revenue goals, and then we, we put different things in places where if their LOS is X, they can get more points here and just kind of make it sort of like a gamification sort of thing. But with that, we need more capital. So if there's any investors out there, you know, we could always use more money. But that's kind of what we're doing. Any other questions? Yes. How big is government regulations in terms of the trucking? Like commercial trucking is very different than the people. Like you have to No, no. Yeah, so, you know, we thought, we, we've actually had some meetings about that where we were like, um, and this is like, because of course we, we've got to think, we think really big. If we're not thinking big, we're not, we're not thinking well. So we, blockchain has been a very popular thing out there now, and we've been looking at different ways where we can leverage blockchain. But the thing was like, okay, what is the problem that blockchain is actually going to solve for us? So we looked at, okay, for drivers, if we could tie into a customer's ERP system, right, and um, we could leverage a customer's credit for the individual trucker because we know that Walmart's always going to pay. And now we've got visibility through their ERP system, and now it's almost like that small trucker has the credit of a Walmart, and now they can grow their fleets and get really good equipment. So those are that's one of the use cases we've kind of looked at, but solving um, driver shortage in particular, we really haven't looked at doing that because that's not really our business model, but we have looked at um, different things and how can we incentivize the companies to grow 
through giving them quality freight. You know, that, that's some of the things we looked at. There is um, one startup that's, um, that's up and coming right now. They're in talks with Volvo on their first round of funding. They're actually at ATDC as well, and they're focused on um, driver shortage. Um, their company, it's called SpotQ, really cool company. So what they're doing is um, they're saying, so the electronic logs are in place now and it's, it's a big problem, you know, no more fudge in the books or anything like that. So drivers can only drive uh, 10 hours, right? Then they got to shut down for a certain amount of time. A lot of times they will run out of those hours based off of being at a dock a lot longer, getting their truck loaded or unloaded. So they're running out of time in mid route to drop off a delivery. So what SpotQ is doing is they're keeping track of the hours of operations and before that truck has to shut down, they're able to bring a quality driver in that truck by using a crowdsource model. It's already vetted, already qualified, so now that load could be delivered. So they're in talks with uh, Volvo right now, very serious talks, and um, they could be making a splash in the industry. So hopefully my, my, my buddy could solve that problem and then we could just leverage his technology. Any other questions? Are you yeah. finding the shippers continuously come back to you for the match to the trucker, or once they get the relationship with that trucker, they go directly with them on the next? No, no, they, we, we definitely measure, um, maintain the relationship with the shipper, and we manage the relationship with the carrier. Because the large shipper, that's the thing, they don't have the bandwidth to work with these small guys. They're, they're small, and you know, they're just like, look, we want to work with one entity and then have access to thousands of assets. You know? So that's how it works. So we'll always maintain that relationship just to make sure that levels of service are there and, and that the transactions are working the way they're supposed to. Yeah. Because you're kind of uh, giving them the access to your stuff, but you don't have any more the leverage of the network. They keep the network. So I'm trying to understand your overall drive to to so much aim for the SaaS perspective. It's no, no it's, a, it's a great question. So when we went to, there, there are companies out there and um, really big companies that, like, for example, um, Lufthansa, they came to visit us yesterday. They came all the way from Frankfurt. We have been talking with them for six, six months, connected with them in Silicon Valley. They came, they have so many regulations because they're an international airline, right? So they have a carrier base that they already work with that's already qualified. So their problem would be an outreach, just like Brascom. Brascom says, hey, we're moving these chemicals. We don't need more capacity. We just need to be more efficient internally. So we just seen that as an opportunity just to get hooks in additional customers. But in that case, you could still offer the service, but on the other side rather than the carrying side, and it'd still be there for every transaction. While if you just put their, your software in their hands, you're out of it. You're just mm -hmm. gonna have your, your leverage, except maybe if you put it on the cloud and still charge them by yeah, absolutely. So we're still working through the revenue model, but it'll be an, um, an integration charge. And then for every load that's moved, we would make, you know, a spread off of that. But if you look at our margins in the industry, how thin they are, and then if we can incorporate the SaaS product in place of that, we'll actually come out a lot better with hooks in our customers that are a lot stronger. But we can, if you've got some good ideas, I'll definitely, you know. I, I mean, just, just mm -hmm. No. You were very careful okay, about this because the power of such businesses like yours okay, is when your network grows. Yeah, that's okay? true. And then you begin to be able to offer services and, and a bunch of things that you could not when you're small. Mm -hmm. so, so beware that you could be killing yourself doing this. So I'm not telling it's bad. Oh, no, I'm no. Telling, just beware and, and don't, don't forget this in the back of your mind. No, I, I appreciate it. We're going to talk offline about that, definitely. You know, hey, we, we by no means know everything. You know, we, we always need help, definitely. I appreciate it. Did you have a question? We're all set. We're good. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Now into the wonderful world of parts and manufacturing, right? Um, so great job, Amari. Yeah. Invigorating. Um, so I'm Paul Noble. I'm founder and CEO of Audit. And we are also an ATDC company, so I'm a, even less of a, than a stone's throw away from Omari and his team. 
And what our organization does is we are using artificial intelligence, developing a platform that harmonizes parts data and predicts inventory in the manufacturing supply chain. So I'll jump quick into a brief overview of my background and how we got started. Um, so I grew up in the supply chain in my uh, you know, early part of my career. I worked for Sherwin-Williams for a little over 10 years. Most of that time was spent in the industrial manufacturing supply chain, industrial distribution channel. And so we would sell our book of brands and products through distributors like Granger and Fastenal, HD Supply, to industrial manufacturing customers. So I worked on large deals to go to uh, you know, Coca-Cola or UPS and sell them our products at all their facilities. And, and then subsequently ran the Eastern US business unit um, within that group, about a $30 million business unit. And more and more on my time doing it kind of in the trenches by myself, as well as um, leading a team across a large geography, uh, saw that there were massive data problems within the supply chain. And it was affecting my business, it was affecting my distributor partners' businesses, and it was costing manufacturing companies millions and millions of dollars across their enterprises. So after feeling that pain for a long period of time, um, I decided, hey, let me go tackle this myself. So I'm a not a native Atlantan. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally, moved with Sherwin-Williams to Atlanta. And after I was here for a few years before starting the company, and we initially started it as a sales enablement company for suppliers and distributors to better serve manufacturing companies. And um, I got connected to ATDC and it was really uh, a testament to the ecosystem of you know, how we were able to develop as a company, company early on and how we've continued to develop. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into my, my, our current team and how we met at ATDC. But just to give some exposure for those that maybe aren't as familiar with the uh, startup ecosystem and you know, all of the great resources you have here. We feel very fortunate to have you all as a resource to us and the connection to Georgia Tech. Um, but this entire Atlanta ecosystem is, you know, right up there with, you know, competing with Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, Chicago. Um, so be aware of that. There's a lot of opportunity here. And, and you know, that's why we really took, um, took notice and decided to, you know, I had opportunities to move out of Atlanta, but decided to plant our roots here and build the company here, um, which we're really excited on the trajectory we were going. So, um, so started this sales enablement company and don't want to bore you too much with that, but as Amari talked about in startup life, fail fast. So we, realized that we were in the kind of the wrong part of the supply chain. While I knew what the pain points were of being a supplier, and I knew the pain points of the distribution partners, we were too far downstream from the actual problem. And we were with parts of the supply chain, distribution and supply, that were too far behind in technology to adopt something that we were developing for them. It wasn't a big enough pain point. They were worried about competing against Amazon and getting an e-commerce site and adopting a CRM, not bolting on something that can help them you know, on top of something like Salesforce. So with that said, about a year ago, we pivoted and we began focusing and we've lear we learned a lot in that process about those data challenges and went to the manufacturing customers themselves. And what we discovered and what I'll kind of get into here is really what our business is today and what we've been developing over the last year. And what we realized is that, yes, data was a problem, but why was it a problem? And um, if you think of global manufacturing organizations, they spend trillions of dollars on parts to maintain their assets and facilities. 
as well as produce their products. And if you look at something like automotive or equipment, they also have service parts networks that they need to manage. And that data is you know, in the millions and millions of movements um, and data points. So what's the problem? It's the systems that they're running off of. So SAP, Oracle, all these legacy ERP systems that they're running off of. It's not that they don't want to manage this data better. It's that the systems of record that they're working off of were invented before the internet. So they're, by nature, extremely disconnected, a mix of on-prem and cloud and all sorts of you know, various instances, Frankenstein systems, like Amari was talking about. Um, They've just been plugging holes and trying to, each organization is trying to figure out these problems. So what that causes is disparate data. So you picture a global organization, you're a VP of supply chain, and you have all these different silos of data across the globe. So how can you manage that as one organization? So that's the first problem. And then the addition, in addition to the disconnectivity, everything is still very manual in those systems. So if you look at you know, parts, so we're focused on maintenance parts. You're talking about like Siemens motors and Timken bearings and all these things that make the facilities go. When a company orders that, Siemens gives them the physical good. They don't give them the digital footprint of that product. So if I'm Coca-Cola bottler, I get the motor and I have to enter that into my SAP system manually and there's character limitations, and there's all these manual entry points for inventory and criticality and all these things that are just way too difficult to manage. So as we were developing this business, we knew about the, that pain point, and we, need, we knew we needed to solve the problems that these legacy ERP systems were creating. So at that point, we figured you know, what is there to help make human superhuman especially around data, it's artificial intelligence. So um, we began developing this platform to be able to essentially look at these issues at every individual organization, where can we show value to a global manufacturer? And so we took that information and we began building an AI that can go in to the ERP system and read these material master um, records that they have. So you picture all the parts needed across a global enterprise, it's hundreds of thousands of records. And there's massive amounts of duplication and all those manual problems are just incredibly challenging to wrap your arms around. So we have an AI that first reads that um, and understands the different variables that, you know, you may call something a motor one thing, I may describe it as somewhere, something else. So when you have all these people across an organization entering this data, it's all different. So we can go in and read and, and uh, merge and classify things that may be duplicates and really right size the data and understand what's there and what they use. And it's not your traditional cleanse. We're not cleansing it to make it e-com ready data with all the attributes. We're just understanding what it is so that we can better um, wrap our arms around it to start. And because it's real time, we're consistently making it better. On top of that, the disparate data that we talked about, we're able to merge that, whether it's the same ERP system or multiple ERP systems. Um, a lot of the issues ca are caused through mergers and acquisitions. So if I acquire a company, typically you're just stacking their data on top of your data, and it just companies that grow that way specifically are a target of ours because um, their pain point is huge. So we merge that and create a global source of truth so they can run their company off of the same data. Makes pretty easy sense, um, but it's not that easy to do. So everyone understands, and you see a ton of data companies, and everyone understands that data is really, really important, but it's really hard to monetize the value in, in a lot of cases, right? So there's a lot of traditional methods out there that, um, that you look at that are ecstatic. So a consultant, I hire a consulting company, they come and cleanse my data, they give it back to me, and the next five minutes later, it's already starting to deteriorate, right? That's what we're attacking um, in many cases. Or 
there is a software solution using older technology and linear regression models and all sorts of different things like that, that, you know, you can't really put like, all right, I cleaned my data, now I hope it saves me money as a business. So one thing to keep in mind as you're entering the business world or as you're doing business is while technology may be cool, well, how's it gonna save these organizations money, especially the types of organizations that we're working with, right? Um, so keep that in mind. So we kept that in mind as we were developing this and that's where that third part of it is. So we're using AI to take all of that material record data and marry it to inventory movements. So there's hundreds of thousands of data records and then there's millions of movements across this organization. So that's movements like I ordered this from the supplier, then I received it on this date, and then I issued it to the maintenance person, and then, or they put it back into stock. Like all these movements are really difficult to, to manage and understand. So what happens is that because the data is bad, because there's so many movements, it's hard to really grasp. Companies are wasting tens of millions of dollars in working capital. They're working off of subjective inventory management strategies. So it's, they go, if I stock more, I'll be more reliable. Because as we're talking manufacturing, any, any business that inventories things, but specifically in manufacturing, it's all about you know, Six Sigma reliability, right? So if we're talking Six Sigma, you're saying, all right, I want to be 99.999% um, reliable, always have things in stock. Um, so if you tell me to stock less, I think that I might run out, so I, I don't want to do that. So that's why there's this disconnect in inventory optimization in a lot of cases. Um, so what we do is we take movements from five, 10 years of history, and we relate it to a sigma level so we can optimize stocking levels with that data so we can actually tie it to uh, dollar-related outcomes. So we can say you can reduce your inventory by 30%, which is our average right off the top, because there's so many problems and it's been overlooked for so long. And you can remain Six Sigma reliable. And we make it very easy. I don't have a demo to show you, um, but we make it very easy. They can look by plant and just essentially say, all right, what does it cost me to be Six Sigma, Five Sigma, Four Sigma? What does that save me dollar wise and how can I optimize that for the entire organization or plant by plant. You know, some plant managers won't want to roll the dice. Others will to save money on their you know, profit and loss statements. So, um, so that inventory prediction is important and that's really what we look at as a, a value initially to our customers, right? We have to, we know that we can't just go and like, hey, we have AI, it's gonna help you, you'll learn more and you'll get better. Believe us, please, you know? Um, so we want to show them value up front, which is this working capital reduction, money talks, and that's what we do to help. And it helps us understand, but what it also does is that's our data acquisition strategy. So AI, as you know, needs a lot of data to learn from and be trained um, appropriately in what to look for. So this data acquisition strategy is so important because it gets the data flowing and we can learn by their use of their ERP system. So we're not putting them into a new system. We're essentially the intelligence behind the scenes of these ERP systems. So as they use um, SAP, we can understand the types of decisions they make and how that related to a dollar outcome and learn whether it's positive or negative and use the future learnings and not always looking back to the history to improve predictions over time um, for them across different business units and why that's important. And this is a, a bit of a case study of like what we show a customer, right? So uh, this might give you a better understanding. So if you look at what we go in, we look at uh, material master data, movement history, how much are you inventorying? How much are you holding? Typically it's about 12 months of usage or need that organizations are planning for and some plan Look at this maybe every month, maybe a quarter, maybe once a year, sometimes never, right? So this number just keeps inflating. 
Um, but on average, it's about 12 months. So we give them 12 months, here's what you hold, and then we, we create a baseline of what do you actually use every month. So that's pretty simple, it's not hard to figure out. And there's a, a massive gap between that. And so we, we joke around and call that God mode. So like, if you had no inventory and everything appeared right when you needed it, this is what you would spend. And so that's where we start attacking. And that's where our technology essentially learns from their organization. And we take that total inventory held number and we keep shrinking it and shrinking it. So we say to our customers, we're gonna take you from this just in case subjective strategy more and more truly just in time, and you'll become more and more reliable for less and less money um, and less inventory held. So um, that's really beneficial to each individual organization. And, uh, but as we said, um, we're looking at a specific part of the supply chain, which is maintenance repair operations. So this is a, I think I have a slide on this too. I'm jumping around a little bit, but it's a huge market in itself. And it's a, it's a niche that we can really carve, hook in, go dominate early, right? This is our, is our vision. But all of these same companies, so back to the disconnectivity, you look at um, a couple of our customers and Pipeline, for instance. So if you look at Mohawk Industries and Graphic Packaging International, both Atlanta-based companies, and AB InBev and Kimberly Clark and Georgia Pacific, they all use the same products, generally speaking, from a maintenance perspective. Same motors, same drives, but they're all independently, even as siloed as they are in their own organizations, they're all working in silos across these organizations, right? So what we're doing from a network effect perspective is we're reading all of their catalogs and we're anonymously understanding the Siemens motor that's used by all of them. We create a master knowledge base around not only attributes, but reliability and usage data that allows us to improve prediction and data control across our network of customers. So it's not data sharing in set, um, necessarily, it's just a deeper understanding. So we're creating a brain around MRO that can sit on any ERP system and can help the network affect and allow them to know that if they don't use a part as much as someone else, what may they expect from that part in terms of reliability and help improve their inventory prediction. Um, so not only is that there a network effect there, but there's also, you know, why are we a recurring value? Why should a customer keep us hooked in after we showed them this big pop of savings in year one? A, we're gonna to continue to show them better and better savings, but it won't be as significant as year one. But B, the, it goes back to large organizations. Um, what AI can allow them to do is where they're really good, and this is what we work long term with a lot of customers on, is you, you think, you know, I'm Kimberly Clark, I'm really good at what I do in North America, but South America, not so good, and we're moving into Asia, and we have operations in Europe. So what AI can help them do, and what we specifically help them do, um, is transfer knowledge from their best people to the system. So the system begins learning at what the best demand planners or what the best inventory management um, personnel that they have, so making the human superhuman, back to that whole um, analogy. It allows them to transfer knowledge to the system so the system begins to be smarter and we eliminate the variability. So everyone becomes more level at the highest level, um, which is really intriguing because it's very difficult to train all of those individuals as people turn over, retire, a lot, 99% of that knowledge is locked in um, their personnel's heads. So. Um, so what this does is, for us, allows operations, procurement, and finance to have a unified strategy um, you know, from this perspective. So operations gets their confidence that they'll always have what they need to be reliable and operate the plant, maximize uptime for the lowest cost. Procurement can drive out costs because they have a better understanding and can drive down inventory and eliminate tail spend and buy from 
um, more streamlined vendors, and then finance knows what, is, what are we spending, where do we have opportunities to save working capital, and how can we have a greater finger on the pulse across the organization. So this is the really cool part, though. So we talk about, that's all boring stuff. <laughs> um, so we talked about you know, intelligent digital supply chain, right? That's our vision, is we do all these things to show value. But w what we're trying to do and what we're building as a company is this connected, intelligent digital supply chain so that the information of what manufacturers are using can better connect them with their suppliers of those parts so they can understand how they're being used right now that part of the supply chain is completely disconnected. So by going to the manufacturers as we did, we're now, rather than swimming upstream with the original business that we were developing, we're swimming downstream and passing relevant and good data through the entire supply chain. So each part can do what they do better. They can understand how their products are being used. If I'm Siemens, I know how my product's being used. I know, um, you know better forecasting. I know how I can improve my product because I know how it's being used by my customers, which if you know distribution, really you have zero visibility. When I was a supplier, I had zero visibility of who was actually using my products unless it was an isolated case where they called us in or a distributor of ours brought us in. Um, so that's really powerful. So that, the point of that is, the, is creating a digital footprint of physical goods. Um, and so we start with the value to our customers in uh, vendor optimized inventory and procurement, working capital. But where I'm really excited about what this can do is that we can now under better understand the digital needs or the needs in general of what, what type of parts can be printed on demand, right? So through additive manufacturing, what are they inventory now that can, um, they can eliminate from inventory and begin to print those parts? and transfer digital rights from Siemens rather than actually Siemens having to make and ship and inventory the products to them. Um, how can we leverage IoT systems and understand all of the data that's being pulled from an asset and you're predicting maintenance failures, but then you go back to the um, old way of you know, ordering something and pulling it out of stock. We want to connect that system and those different systems. So we want, you know, we're essentially creating this central ecosystem where the digital, digital footprint, digital rights are all understood and can be appropriately distributed. Um, and again, I, I joke about this. There is certainly a, an opportunity for a trusted ledger, uh, but it wouldn't be a startup presentation if we didn't talk about the opportunity for blockchain um, in our business model, right? And we might do an ICO so soon, too. All right. So um, uh, the technology itself, from a blueprint perspective, and is that you know, as we're building and we're focused on specific things that we know, it's indirect materials, it's maintenance. But as we're building the technology, there's the opportunity for, and we've already been um, asked many, many times by customers and prospects, hey, can you do this for our direct parts? The, the parts that go into our automobile or the raw materials that we buy. Can you look at specific signals? Um, yes, we can. So we're looking at that and we see it as an applicable growth with each of our customers because they have both. Um, and the use of that technology to really optimize more of their supply chain and digitize more of their supply chain. And so as we, as we look, we, we're in a fortunate situation that uh, we've partnered and we're selected to partner with SAP. So they have a, you know, SAP recognized and, you know, continues to work with us. So they have a program called SAP.io. Um, this is their innovation arm. It rolls up into their strategy group. And so we've been splitting time between Atlanta and the Bay Area in San Francisco, um, working with them, understanding deeper, um, a deeper understanding of the challenges that their system causes, where they're going and where we can help integrate more effectively and not be working against each other, uh, but be working with each other on how can this seamless, seamlessly be added to add value to their system, add value to their customers, 
and get them you know, moving their customers from on-prem to the cloud, as is one of their number one focuses as an organization. Um, so for us, that was super important as a startup to get the validation of the system we're building off of for them to bring us in. And um, if you know anything about SAP or Oracle or any of these behemoth ERP systems, they're really difficult to work with, even when you have a relationship with, like ours. Um, so that's been really important for us as, as we continue to work with customers. Um, but to try to work with them without that uh, would be really, really difficult. And it, what it did for us as a startup is it, you know, if you're attacking a market and there's a market leader there or someone that you know, is that system of record, you'd be surprised how important it is to really go uh, verify your assumptions. So we had a lot of assumptions of where we could help based on the customers telling us their pain about SAP, but it was so important and accelerated our growth as a company you know, by at least a year, if not more, by actually working with them over the last several months, concentrating on the back end and like, what do we need to do to integrate and make this seamless in real time and position us to effectively um, take what our customers are telling us and make it a reality. Um, so we went into this, our target customers, our manufacturing customers, five or more plants as they grow. Um, as the number grows, the problems grow. So we're looking at, you know, probably even more 10 plus plants. Uh, you see the problems continue to, to grow and we're focused obviously on SAP, but we also see this applicable to other systems as well and work with those customers. And these are some of our customers as we've mentioned. Um, so a cool story about how we met and back to, it sounds like a commercial for ATDC, but we love it that much. Um, so ATDC is a great spot. It's even the past three years that you know we've been there. Um, it's grown significantly, and um, these are my co-founders. So both Georgia Tech grads. Um, J.R. Lamas is a neural AI expert. So the AI we're talking about is neural AI. It allows us to just kind of go crazy, right? And learn, learn as it learn as it goes. Um, he's also a uh, part of the Perpetual Lab as a fellow. And we met through ATDC, JR and George. Um, they were working on another business that was just wrong time, data problems in the manufacturing space, so common theme there. They were working on a visual recognition technology for parts. So you may be familiar with a company called uh, PartPick that was acquired by Amazon uh, that, uh, uh, within the last year or two. Um, they were working on something very similar called part, part scope, and we connected initially on our original ideas, and we're looking like, hey, how can we work together? We were working with a lot of tool manufacturers, so on and so forth. Um, but it goes back to what Amari talks about from a relationship standpoint and how important network can be and meeting new people and understanding people that are focused on different things than you are, because things come back around. So fast forward a year or so later, we had made our pivot, part scope, wasn't working out as uh, effective as, or as, while the technology was cool, it was just a nice to have. The data was the problem. We were experiencing the same thing. The data was the problem. So we came together and we had that common, common thread and we knew AI and it was the solution. Um, so through ATDC, we connected and, and have developed our, uh, our current product and our current company. Um, from there, so I just think it's you know it's a really a testament to um, the ecosystem, the tech ecosystem, and uh, and and how it pays dividends. So um, other than that, from like where we're at as a company, um, we're you know finalizing a, our first institutional funding round, um, so we're going to be growing significantly um, over the next six months and beyond, um, you know, double, doubling or tripling the team within the next few months, and uh, hiring engineering resources, hiring sales resources uh, to, to really give this a go and attack the market um, very, very quickly. So 
Um, I guess with that, you know, time-wise, I don't know how well I was on time. Yeah, good. We have time for questions. All right, cool. We can, uh, yeah, answer any questions you might have. Yeah. I mean, just so I understand your product, is it cloud-based or is it like a, is it a black box? Is there some kind of dashboard that the It's a magic has? box. No. <laughs> um, one of our customers actually used that. You guys are the magic box. Um, so no, it's, yeah, it's uh, cloud-based. Um, so when it integrates, like, you have SAP, yeah. and you just build some integration through an, and it's through an API, yeah, yeah and, and we can, where we can pull the right data points to understand and, and organize, and then we do have a dashboard of sorts and reports that they can see, you know, all of that complex data presented to them and, like, suggestions of where they should make, you know, we, we use predictions, so we'll give them a prediction from an inventory perspective, and they can either take prediction or not take the prediction, and then we'll learn from that. And is, is the person taking the prediction typically like a high-level manager, like the users of your system? Or yeah, so we can understand the usage of someone that's just placing orders and doing things like that, like that specific data, but then there's also um, typically inventory optimization teams and planners that are looking at this you know, from a business unit or a, a geography or you know, a global perspective that will be making more of like the specific decisions and strategy decisions off of that information. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. So, so basically the, the artificial intelligence, um, I guess, tool connects to ACP. Um, is there any, like, for a company that you are working with, uh, what would be like the requirements for that company and for their system with regards to having like a different system, not so like yeah. known like uh, with different processes? As yeah, so yeah, with, with that change of, you know, companies that have invested in older instances of SAP, there are, um, it's easiest with someone that's moving to or is on the S4 HANA platform or any cloud-based ERP system easier to integrate, easier to um, take advantage of those integrations. So that's much more seamless in what we're focusing on from a product perspective. But any, any customer that's on a, more of a legacy system, depending on which version that is, there are ways that we can map the data out of on-premise systems. It's just less real time. You know, it's still dramatic, we, I mean, we, we joke that we take these customers from you know the Flintstones to leave it to Beaver if anyone gets those references <laughs> um, before we need to take them to the to be the Jetsons so to speak so we can work with any customer on any system we can work with CSV exports from you know a non SAP system or you know JD Edwards or something like that an old model but um, certainly we're targeting the lowest hanging fruit which is those customers moving to cloud or already on the cloud. Like, with regards to a project, like, how fast does it work? Like, is it something that works immediately? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so it's not, it's not uh, something that you can just, like, at this point, uh, we're working towards that, uh, where you just download and it, it works across the enterprise, right? So there is some understanding and integration involved, but our integration strategy is much less than, you know, adopting a new ERP system. So we typically give a, a time frame of about 90 days that we can understand, um, get in. And at that point, too, uh, as we're moving forward with the customer into a, contract, a contractual relationship, we've already done analysis. We've already seen their data, trained some of it, understand that. So we can begin showing value um, almost immediately and can do those analysis, uh, the analysis really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's um, we you know when we're asked about competition, we're uh, so w things that we're seeing are some software-based solutions that are using machine learning and and more traditional algorithms to look at some of the same types of data and um, offer similar results. Where we're a little bit different, we haven't seen you know, our particular approach 
as specific, tying data harm, inventory optimization, and deep learning kind of all together. Um, and so we think we're a little, you know, we're on the leading edge of that. Um, we do see these technologies that will be adopted by more, you know, see our window closing um, within the next few years of that we're the, you know, the one with this technology. Um, but we're also look a lot of what we're attacking is project-based work, consultant-based work, consultants that have developed um, procurement type software or software that you know, goes on uh, you know, with humans behind the scenes, uh, analysts behind the scenes is really much of the space we're attacking. But you know, it's, we're certainly not without competition, but um, our unique approach has us a little ahead of the curve. Yeah. I, I, I made, made sense clearly. Then you switch to inventory with your Six Sigma and all of this, and, and then you get to a field where there's a lot of analytical models and optimization models related to this. So I, I'm wondering, are you still using like a neural net or whatever okay, to, to, to try to tackle those problems, or you're integrating such model into your, uh, into your own box? Yeah. So. Um, to start, like where we perform our initial analysis, analysis um, there is neural net, but looking at history is not, it's not as needed. It's really creating that baseline. So we can learn a lot and do some optimization there, but it's, you know, where we're using the neural net is based on when we were to hook in and learn from the decisions. So that's really where, and from an inventory optimization standpoint, where we can take each individual decision and add it to the prediction models. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's more looking forward and and knowledge transfer. That's that where it's being used and applying it um, to that prediction. The point is, uh, you shoot in, in several directions at the same time, which is, which yeah. is normal for us, uh, this small venture like yours. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so this can be huge. Okay, there. So yeah. So be careful, okay, to to not having all those jewels. <laughs> right. Suddenly thinking they're very small. Okay, you can grow a huge business. Okay, just out of that that little thing. Yeah. Very much. Very, very much, very much so. so. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And it's something that we're consistently, you know, trying to remain focused on because we, we do get asked a lot of like, because that direct materials piece is a bigger component of revenue for a lot of these customers. So they're, you know, we understand and, and we've gotten less away from getting pulled in a lot of directions um, and focusing on the data component itself. Um, and being focused on that, but we're very, very much committed to building the MRO niche right now because it is so valuable and it is, you know, uh, even more unloved than the other parts of the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, we're coming uh, right up on 1.30. Oh, you yeah, got one more question. question? Yeah, so we're going to be doing more, more uh, traditional marketing type, type uh, targeted marketing, ABM type marketing, um, account-based marketing, and we know the types of customers that um, would be a good fit. So we've been targeting those that were either introduced through Georgia Tech and ATDC, or SAP is bringing us into deals. Uh, we're working with consultants that are bringing us into deals, and then we're doing direct outreach on our own. Uh, so we haven't had to just like, you know, do a bunch of uh, traditional marketing things where we're, you know, 
um, targeting through ads and stuff like that. Um, we're really just going to people that we know have this problem and just saying, hey, this is what we do. Let's work. And um, based on our value to them, we don't need <clears throat> we don't need hundreds of thousands of customers. Like our revenue model is SaaS based, but it's based on physical locations of of how many plants do you have, and that metric is really important to our growth. Um, so that that yields that we need, you know, a handful of customers to be really pretty successful from a startup perspective. Um, so we're just focused on like, hey, let's find those that have the most specific need that we can be directly connected with, and then we're going to be adding to the funnel dramatically over the next year. Good question. Thanks. I mean, so SAP, they traditionally wouldn't try to integrate mm. your technology into their product or into their own module on top of their product. They'd yeah. rather just have that kind of a best of breed solution. Yeah, so we're working with them directly on, on some proof of concepts where they're um, testing our technology on potentially being in specific modules. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. a, a small word of it as director of uh, supply chain and logistics institute. Yeah. Uh, I think you, both of you here was a trial that, that we did and say, uh, yeah. this makes sense, okay, can we get a presentation that's not going to be just a sales pitch, but we'll get content and be able to be fruitful for, for our audience and, and at the same time good for you guys. And I think you calibrated pretty nicely and uh, this encourages us to uh, do others of that style so that we're going to link more and more with uh, the ATDC and yeah. the, the overall work of uh, uh, Love Tech. I begin to call them Love Tech. I feel so uh, <laughs> FinTech, so I say hey, let's have Love Tech. Yeah, so I like that. Technology, so Love Tech type of company. And, uh, just both of you, okay, you what you've been talking about, I can write about, I write about 10 PhD theses, okay? <laughs> be done around, around that stuff. Yeah. And a lot of capstone projects, a lot of things at the master's level. So, so there's a lot of material around what, you, what you're doing. Yeah. And they, as, we, as, as the relationships grow, there's a lot of potential for a really nice collaboration. Yeah, yeah. we really enjoyed it. I, I, I love doing things like this, and um, wherever we can be helpful, uh, anyone you know, specifically, please reach out. Um, we'd lo lo love doing these types of things. Yeah. Thanks for the time.